Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I'm Eric Lee. I've uh, been in the church for a long time, and uh, this is the, the second sermon that uh, God has sucked me into preaching to you guys. Um, I am not, I'm not a professional, uh, this is, uh, actually I don't mind being up in front of you, you know, stage fright, that's not really my problem, because I don't really care what you guys think of me, <laughs> but um, I'm, not, I'm not a verbal person, you know, Kurt has this amazing ability to just open his mouth and words just flow, and I uh, have difficulty with that. I can think great thoughts in my head and I can write them out on paper. I actually have a whole stack of notes here for this morning. But, and I'm very pleased with what God gave me and what I wrote down, but I am terrified of what it's going to sound like when it comes out of my mouth. So I need your grace this morning. I'm going uh, to rely really heavily on my notes, uh, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, I'll be looking down a lot, but please try to stick with me and I think, I think we'll find something uh, really, uh, I think we'll find a revelation of God. Um, Kirk, the verse you read this morning after the worship was, uh, it made me laugh when I heard you read the reference because uh, that was actually something that I had cut out of my slide deck for lack of time. <laughs> Kurt's like, you got to cut it down, you got to cut it down, less, 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 and so, yeah, God just snuck it in the back door, so thank you. That was, uh, you, you said that it wasn't really relevant, it was actually perfectly relevant, as, as you will see. Okay. So... Uh, we've been in the Empowered series. Uh, and that has been a great walk through Luke, through 1 Corinthians. Uh, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, uh, how he empowers us. Uh, we've been talking about the gifts that he gives us. We've been talking about miracles and uh, working in power and authority. And that has been a great conversation. As Kurt said, things are really going well uh, in a lot of ways. I've been hearing a lot of people saying, man, this, this really seems like a new season. It's exciting. Uh, God is teaching me new things, and so it's great to hear uh, people talk that way. And I'm really fascinated to see where we go with the rest of this, uh, to, to learn what God uh, wants to teach us there. But uh, in the middle of that exciting conversation, which is uh, very uh, positive. I also want to keep it very real because there is a balancing side to all of that. And the reality is this. Um, you know, when we, when we pursue miracles, when we pray and ask God for his will and we get a sense of what he wants and then we speak it out and we say, God, work in this situation, it doesn't always go the way that we want it to go. Right? How many of you have, have prayed something and really thought that God had said something? You really thought you knew that he was going to do something and then it didn't work out that way? Almost everyone. Um, we have this idea that when we see everything work out the way that we wanted it to, that that is God's uh, evidence of blessing on us, that we're doing things right and that we're close to him, and that we haven't sinned lately. <laughs> and then uh, conversely, when things don't go well for us, we have this idea that, well, I'm not, I'm not in a good place. I messed up somehow. I don't understand God. Uh, you know, my theology is bad. I sinned somehow. Uh, we have that idea for ourselves, and unfortunately, we have that idea for other people as well. We can condemn other people when things don't go well for them because we say, you must not be in a good place with God. It must be your fault somehow. Um, 
So that idea that, you know, when things are going well, that's because we're in a good place, there is a lot of truth to that, of course, because, you know, we've been asking the question in the past few weeks. Uh, Jesus said that we should see miracles in our life, that we should do greater works than he did, and so we're asking, why don't we see that? And we're looking uh, for what we need to do to take that step to get closer to that. So there is truth, but it's not all of the truth. Um, so here's, here's what is actually reality. That is, when you pursue God with all of your heart, with total passion, you will discover something that is very uncomfortable and unsettling, and that is that God is unpredictable. And that's kind of a hard word, unpredictable. I mean, God is, he's, he's unchanging, right? He is always consistent with himself. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But scripture also says, who can know the mind of God? So he's unpredictable to us because we don't understand his ways. So if you're totally serious about your Christian walk, you will run into a time when your disappointment with God will absolutely crush you. It will be as crushing as anything else that has ever happened in your life. And it will leave you broken, and it won't even be your fault. It's been said that disappointment is a function of expectations. When we expect a lot, then we can be very disappointed when those expectations aren't fulfilled. Um, we're supposed to have absolute faith in God. As we get closer to him, we lean on him, rely on him more and more. Our faith builds and increases uh, so that our, our expectations of God grow exponentially, and that's the way it ought to be. But that puts us in a very dangerous position because when those expectations aren't met to our satisfaction, uh, that blow is, is absolutely devastating. And it can and does destroy people's lives so that they turn and walk away and never come back to God. And there are different ways of walking away, right? And some people just say, well, that's fine, I'm no longer a Christian anymore. But actually that's not what normally happens. What normally happens is a person is devastated with disappointment and they say, well, I know I'm supposed to still go to church, so I'm going to do that, but when I show up there, I'm not really going to engage I'm just going to go through the motions. I'm going to sit in the seat. I'll smile at people and say hi and you know, stand up when I'm told to and sit down when I'm told to. But that's it. I don't engage with God anymore because I don't understand him. Um, I know that it works that way because I've been there and I've done that a lot. So um, that's where we're going to go this morning. It's not going to be a very happy sort of sermon. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you want, I can just recycle my old one where we talked about space and stars and everything was really cool and I could jump around the stage. Uh, this, this is not that. I'm sorry. But as Kurt says, it is where we're going and I'm asking you to walk there with me. Uh, I would like to have uh, Josh Morris pray for the sermon this morning and lift up another church too as always. Father, thank you for Eric. Thank you for the, the gift of communication and teaching that you've given him. Um, thank you for the word that you've spoken to him to give to us, Father. And I just ask that you would um, let our hearts, let our spirits be open to your word, to your leading today. Holy Spirit, that our lives would be changed because of what you've spoken through Eric and that we can go out and change the world around us. Um, Father, thank you for Hope Church Australia. Um, thank you for the things that you spoke to them yesterday. And I just ask that, that, um, that those words would resonate in their heart this week, that they would, uh, that they would speak of your truth um, in their world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, to make sense of this, we're going to look at a couple of stories. Uh, the first one is the story of John the Baptist, which should be pretty easy starting out because we've been talking about John a lot. There's a lot of stories of him in Luke. Uh, we've covered them uh, all in our Empowered series so far. So you guys uh, hopefully remember 
the, the sequence of events. Uh, the angel Gabriel came to Zechariah, right, and announced, you are going to have a son, and he is going to be amazing. He is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit even before birth. He is going to be a prophet that will prepare his people, prepare Israel for the Messiah. That's, that's an amazing sense of purpose right there in John's life, right? I think when he grew up and was thinking about, you know, where should I go to college and what should I study? Um, I don't think he had a lot of doubt about that. He knew what he was supposed to do. An angel had spoken it, foretold it over him before he was even born. You are going to prepare the way of the Messiah. Um, you remember that when Mary was pregnant and she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, uh, that when she entered the house, it says that John leaped in Elizabeth's womb at the presence of Mary and of Jesus. So even before he was born, the Holy Spirit was on him, was speaking to him, was saying, this is my son. This is the one that you are sent to prepare the way for. This is the purpose of your life. Uh, when John entered his ministry, it was, it was filled with single-minded devotion. He is out in the desert um, eating and wearing whatever he can find, basically, right? He's wearing clothes of camel hair, uh, eating locusts and wild honey. He, he's not concerned with any Thing having to do with creature comforts, anything having to do with himself, he is totally sold out to this idea that I am preparing the way of the Lord. He, uh, he preaches to the crowds. Uh, most of the people in the crowds instantly repent when they hear his words, and they just cry out, what should we do? And he tells them. Uh, Jesus says that John is the greatest person who had ever lived, and that's saying something. Uh, then we get to this part of the story where John baptizes Jesus uh, in the Jordan River. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. When God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then John said, I saw this happen. I saw it happen to Jesus, that guy standing right there. So I testify that he is the chosen one of God. I mean, that is pretty powerful. This is the, the pinnacle, the culmination of John's whole life that he's able to announce the Messiah, and then he's able to point right to the guy and say, God told me that, that this would happen. He told me what to expect, and then he filled my expectations exactly. I saw it happen. I testify this is the chosen one of God. But then something happened to John that he didn't expect, and this is actually the last we hear of John for quite a while in the Gospels. I think that's true. I hope it's true. I'm sure someone will correct me if it's not. Uh, but yeah, I think he disappears. And when he shows up again, he is a very different person. This is jumping forward to Luke 7. The disciples of John the Baptist told John about everything that Jesus was doing. So John called for two of his disciples, and he sent them to the Lord to ask him, Are you the Messiah, or are you the one we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Or where did that come from? And we know how, G how John talks. We just were reading. We know that he is burning with conviction and passion. We know that he stands on this bedrock foundation, and all of a sudden he's saying, are you the Messiah? What, what happened? Well, this happened. Um, as John was preaching to the crowds, 
he, uh, he really didn't spare anyone. That was one of his enduring little qualities. And uh, he called out Herod, Herod Antipas, who was the ruler of that area. Uh, now, the Herod family was really messed up. It was like total Jerry Springer material. Um, in this case, Herod had divorced his first wife so that he could go steal his half-brother's wife and marry her. Oh, and by the way, she was also his niece. So it was a huge mess. It was one of many problems that he had, and John the Baptist called him out. Well, Herod did not have that reaction of, oh, you're so right, what should I do? Instead, Herod grabbed him and threw him into prison. Herod threw him into the, into the fortress of Macris. We know that from uh, the writings of Josephus, which is this amazing, uh, grim, foreboding fortress that's built on top of uh, a huge hill. And this is actually a picture of one of the caverns, one of the underground cells that are at that fortress. You can go to the country of Jordan today and see this. Um, I don't know if this was actually a prison cell. Uh, it's hard to say, but can you imagine being locked up here? So John spent almost two years there, as far as we know. And all during that time, there was nothing. I mean, that, that whole time was a complete waste, a meaningless waste. And all during that time, his expectations for what the Messiah would do, how the Messiah would act, were violated. Because John thought that he was still the, you know, the forerunner of Christ, preparing the way. And he wasn't done with that yet. And he thought that the Messiah was going to be this amazing king and ruler of Israel that was going to fulfill all the prophecies that were in Isaiah. That, uh, you know, that he would restore the kingdom to its rightful place. He would be his, the, the, the king. That he would uh, you know, release the captives and set the people free. And now John is locked up in prison. So at some point, John's despair is great enough that it prompts him to ask the question that we just read. Are you the Messiah that we've been expecting or should we look for someone else? Um, when it says in the first part of this, of this passage that uh, they told John about everything that Jesus was doing, Jesus was doing some amazing things right now. Um, he had just healed the servant of a Roman official by uh, just saying a word from a distance. He didn't even go to his house, just on the road. He said, okay, he's healed. Uh, he raised a widow's son from the dead. They were carrying him out in his coffin for burial, and he comes by, touches the coffin, says, get up. The guy gets up. Uh, this, and the, the crowds were just in utter astonishment, and they were saying, Surely God is among us. And so John the Baptist's disciples heard about these things, and he, he, they went to John in prison and said, this is what's going on. And somehow, for some reason, that prompted this question. Um, the early commentators, uh, when they wrote about this, this passage and tried to describe what it meant, uh, it's interesting because most of them had this assumption that the people in the Bible, the heroes of the Bible, are supposed to be infallible. That they're perfect. You know, we, when, when God tells us about John the Baptist, that uh, you know, we're supposed to assume that John can not possibly do anything wrong, that he's not human, he's not vulnerable. And so they said, well, this was actually not John being uh, you know, weak in his faith. This was John... Uh, kind of doing a, a kind of a sneaky little thing because he wanted to send his disciples to Jesus. He wanted to hand them off. And so he invented this question. And he said, oh, yeah, I got an errand for you guys. I want you to go over and, you know, talk to Jesus. And while you're there, maybe you'll think he's really cool and you'll just stay there and, and that would be great. Um, the more recent commentators, uh, I think, have have more willingness to admit that maybe John was human just like the rest of us. 
and that maybe John had expectations that weren't being fulfilled here. Maybe John was confused and feeling alone and just not understanding anything about his life at the moment. So, so what did John, what did he really mean by his question? Um, it's, it's really hard to get out the subtext. You know, I wish the Bible would give us more emotional background color. That would be really awesome. Uh, but it, it tends to be very factual. Uh, so we kind of have to color in. And uh, sometimes we get that right, sometimes we get it wrong. So uh, I'm going to tell you what I think God has told me. And uh, you see if it, if it checks out with you. Uh, I think... I, I'm pretty sure John did not forget what he saw. I'm pretty sure John did not, uh, it did not escape his memory that he saw the Spirit come down and rest on Jesus at the Jordan River. But everything since that point did not match that thing that he saw. And so what he knew intellectually didn't match his experience. And I can really appreciate this, the, the problem that presented for him because I myself uh, tend to be an empiricist. You know, I, I, I'm a reality-based person. Let's focus on what actually happened first, and then we'll figure out a way to explain that. But sometimes things happen in your life that you just can't explain, which is a real problem for empiricists like myself and I think like for John. Um, if disappointment is a function of expectations, then John's expectations and his disappointment must have been absolutely crushing. Because, you know, he, his expectations started with the announcement of the angel Gabriel and went on from there. Has, how could you possibly have higher expectations than that? Um, and you see it right there in the question that he asked. Are you the Messiah that we've been expecting? Are you the one who's going to fulfill my expectations, or should I look for someone else to do that? So I don't think disappointment is even the right word here. I don't think it's strong enough. I think the word to use here is abandonment. John felt abandoned, and that's the subtext of the question he was asking. So what answer did Jesus give him? At that very time, Jesus cured many people of their diseases, their illnesses, and evil spirits, and he restored sight to many who were blind. Then he told John's disciples, go back to John and tell him what you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And tell him, God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. Now Jesus' answer was really kind of a non-answer, right? Um... First of all, he, so, so the, John's disciples are standing right there. They're waiting for the answer. Jesus says, hold on a second. I'll be right with you. He turns to the crowd and starts doing miracles right there. He's like, are you watching this? Okay, I'm you know, doing stuff. I'm healing people, making the lame walk, making the blind see. I'm casting out evil spirits, do all this stuff. And then he turns back to John's disciples and says, okay, go tell him that you saw me do all these things. Now, I mean, that's cool. That could, be, that could be a real affirmation of faith, except for one problem. John already knew that. What it said in the, uh, in the first part, I'm trying to go backwards here, there we go. Um, John had already been told that Jesus was doing the miracles, that Jesus was healing people from a distance and raising people from the dead. John knew that, in fact, it is what prompted the question in the first place. So what Jesus told him, I don't think really added anything. I don't think it was helpful. And then you have that last part, which is just, just really hard to understand. Um, there, there is an interesting subtext here, because when Jesus says these things, that the blind see, the lame walk, these are actually uh, quotes. He's pulling phrases out of prophecies about the Messiah from Isaiah uh, 35 and 61. 
and which is, again, kind of cool. It's, it's kind of a message to John of, hey, you know that I'm fulfilling the prophecy here. You know I'm, I'm the Messiah. So there was some of that. But uh, here's something that is not obvious at first. The last phrase there, the good news is bring, being preached to the poor, uh, that is uh, a phrase from Isaiah 61. It's, it's also a phrase that I think we talked about just in the last couple weeks at some point because uh, Jesus uh, was in the temple, remember this story, and he got the scroll and started reading, and he read this passage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the good news to the poor. But what's the next phrase right after that? To release the captives. Okay. But he didn't include that part. And what was John really looking for? He was looking to be released. He was looking to go back to doing his life's work, the thing that he had been prepared for. So I think it's interesting that even Jesus is not immune to carefully choosing what scriptures he quotes. Um, and this, I think John absolutely got the message here when he stopped and didn't continue. So the subtext, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm coloring in the lines. I think it's right, but you check it in your own hearts. I think John is saying, John, I'm your cousin. I'm the son of God. I'm the one who heals the blind. I'm the one who makes the lame walk. I'm the one who raises people from the dead. I'm the one who can heal people just with a word from a distance. And I'm the one who's going to leave you imprisoned in a hole in the ground. I'm the one who's going to let Herod behead you shortly for no good reason other than an obscene dance by a young girl. And I'm not even going to tell you why. Not really. All I'm going to ask is that you trust me. That you don't turn away because of my lack of an answer. I know you have reason to. I know you have reason to turn away. But please don't. So ultimately, Jesus was asking a question right back at John. Will you follow a God you don't understand? And Jesus was not solving John's problems. He wasn't giving him an explanation. He just said, okay, now what? You're in this place. Now that all of your expectations are shattered, and you have nothing left but unanswered questions, what will you do? Will you turn away? You know, Peter had the same moment uh, in his life, well, more than once, but though the one that I want to uh, mention here is when uh, he was with Jesus, Jesus was preaching to the crowds, and Jesus starts saying um, crazy things. He says, in order to follow me, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Basically, as Kurt likes to say, you need to be cannibals to follow me. Which, of course, was a metaphor, but people didn't understand that at the time. And so a lot of Jesus' disciples just packed up and left. They said, forget it. This guy is crazy. I'm out of here. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, what about you? Are you also going to leave? And Peter has a choice to make where nothing makes sense to him. You know, he's, he's left his business. He's left his family. He's following this guy around. And he, we're, we're in crazy town now. And Peter says, No, I'm not going to turn away. It doesn't make sense. You know, Peter doesn't say, right on, Jesus, I got exactly what you were saying. Good metaphor. He doesn't say that. He says, where else would I go? So he chooses not to turn away. And finally, one more thought. I wonder, as Jesus sent this answer back to John, I wonder if Jesus had an echo of his own future voice in his head shouting, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Even John, or even Jesus, was not 
spared this place. So what's the point? This is very depressing. You can tell. Everyone's like, oh, man. I could be watching the Seahawks. Instead, I'm here. I'm sorry. But what is the point to all this? Um, well, before we look for an answer there, I'm sorry I'm going to have to depress you even more. Because <laughs> uh, now I'm going to tell you my own personal story. Um, I'm going to try to go through this quickly. Because, uh, Kurt, you were wrong. This is taking longer than, uh, than our run-through did. <laughs> uh, okay, so my story. This is, this is a very difficult story to tell. Um, I'm not going to get into it too deep. Uh, but it's, it's a story that I have not really shared with, with anyone in particular for a long time. I think the last time I went into it in great detail was with Kurt like 14 years ago and then never since then. Um, so uh, 22 years ago, I think, thereabouts, uh, I was 19 years old. Uh, I was a freshman in college at Oregon Institute, Institute of Technology. Um, it was a state school and you know, not, a, not a Christian environment. I had gone to Christian schools all my life, and so this was you know, the first uh, non-Christian environment that, that I was in. And when I showed up there, uh, there really wasn't much of a Christian presence on campus, uh, not to speak of. But God did a really cool thing. Uh, he brought a bunch of freshmen and other new students who were all Christians and who all had this thing in their hearts that said, we want to explore what it means to live for God. We're all leaving our families and stepping out on our own. Um, we're taking our parents' faith, and this is the first step of making it ours, and so we want to explore what that means together. And it was an amazing time. Uh, there was, I don't know, 40 or 50 of us that all kind of gelled. A lot of us lived in the dorms. It was my first experience of uh, really living in community with people on a day-to-day -day basis, not just seeing my Christian friends for an hour or Sunday morning, but actually living with them, which was amazing. It's given me a passion for uh, for unstructured church and for community uh, ever since then. Uh, we had a, a daily prayer meeting every day at 8 o'clock that was so well attended that sometimes we couldn't even cram people into the room. Uh, and people weren't showing up out of a sense of duty, like, oh man, I've got to go to prayer meeting. Uh, they were showing up because it was just like, God is, is revealing himself, and this is amazing, and I want to be here. It was, it was a very exciting time. Um, but then right in the middle of that, well, about, about six months into that, I, I got to just, just steep in it and, and enjoy it for six months. And then God said something very strange to me. Uh, and this is really the first time that I ever heard God speak to me in a way that I knew was not my own thoughts, but this was someone else's thoughts. This was coming from outside myself. This was God. And he took all the trouble to do that, and here's what he said. He said, you are about to go into a really hard time. This is going to be the hardest time of your life. And if you hold on to me, if you follow me, if you don't turn away from me, then I will be with you and I will bring you through it. It's like, well, where did that come from? I mean, there's, there's nothing tough going on right now. Classes are going well. I'm learning... Uh, about, uh, about God, he's vibrant, he's alive, he's exciting to me. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing bad going on. But then just a couple days later, uh, I got slammed into a brick wall and I found out what God was talking about. There was a particular girl in our Christian group, in, in, in our uh, campus ministry, who uh, I had gotten to be friends with, got to, gotten to know her pretty well. Uh, this is not Tamara. Uh, this was not a girlfriend, this was just a sister in Christ that was a good friend and she was an encouragement to me. Uh, and I'm, I'm purposely not going to use my name, so I uh, apologize for that, but just try to follow the pronouns here. Um, 
she was assaulted by a group of Satanists, which sounds really bizarre. It was, let me tell you. I'm not going to go into any detail on that, but I can say that that was the opening act of three years of pure hell for that girl and for me. Absolute gut-wrenching, soul-destroying hell. Um, most of my friends freaked out because they did not want to have anything to do with this. And they didn't want to have, yeah, they said that. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. So we were left mostly on our own to wrestle through stuff that I had no knowledge of, I was completely clueless about. Remember, I was 19 years old. I was a kid. Just barely older than my oldest daughter is right now. Um, I got so far in over my head that I couldn't even see the surface. It was... Uh, I... I, I Sorry, I, w I wish I could explain it all in great detail so that you could really understand the depths of this. Uh, I don't have the time, and I don't think this is the right forum to do that, but I just want to say that I saw, I mean, I walked through the valley of the shadow of death. When you read about that in the Psalms, I know what that meant. And it's not a fun place. It's a dark place. It's deep uh, it's a place where nothing makes sense, absolutely nothing, and where God does not meet your expectations. Um, I, I expected God to answer our prayers. You know, we would pray and say, God, deliver us. Say, God, rebuke the enemy. God, heal my friend. And he would, in the short term, he would do miracles. He would do amazing things, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a second. But it was never long term. You know, there was always a new thing, a new crisis. It always came back. It dragged on. And I did not understand that because I've been told all my life, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that is true. But it didn't look true. Right there, from my perspective, it did not look true at all. So I was, I was I'm, I'm running out of adjectives here, sorry. I'm, I was driven to the, just the absolute pit of despair many times over. There were places and times when I said, God, I am done. I can't do this anymore. I just, I need to drop out of school and go home because I can't be in this place. But whenever I reached that place, God would extend his hand to me and he would meet me with his spirit. At the same time that everything was so horrible, things were also the most alive and vibrant that it has ever been for me. You know, I was uh, holding on to the Bible, reading the scriptures, like a drowning man holds on to a lifeline. Uh, when Kurt talks about you need to do your devotions every day, um, <laughs> and it, it's 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 kind of ridiculous to use the word devotions for the thing that I was doing because every waking moment that I wasn't doing something else, I was grabbing my Bible and I was reading for dear life. And every time I opened a page, it seemed like God had something new for me there. I just went, oh, God, you are amazing. It felt like I could read the genealogies in Matthew and still go, oh, God, you are amazing. It, 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 I cannot even make you understand how alive and passionate uh, I was to, to God at this time. Um, I saw amazing miracles. I had visions of things that I did not know and that later turned out to be true. Clear visions. I saw angels. I saw demons. Uh, the spirit world was so very real to me. God was real to me. But I was breaking inside at the same time. So the end of that story, I, I wish 
I wish I could say that, um, you know, it all ended with a bang, you know, like a Hollywood movie does. You have the climax, and then you have the demunton, or the French word, whatever. I'm looking at my French student over here. <sighs> Where everything is explained, and all the loose ends are wrapped up, but that did not happen. Um, it, 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 it ended not with a bang, but with a whimper. Um, it just kind of faded out, and we never really understood why. We never got answers to the questions of why. Why did this happen? Why did it happen the way that it did? Uh, but here's, here's the last thing that, that was devastating to me, the last breaking of my soul. And this is, in some ways, the hardest one because I'm still living it out today, 22 years later. And that is, uh, as the... As the crisis with my friend died down and basically went away, blessedly, that intimacy with God, that face-to-face -face communication that was my lifeline, it also dried up. For no apparent reason. And it happened slowly, gradually, so that I didn't even notice it at first. But uh, I, at some point I started to realize, you know, I haven't picked up my Bible for a couple of days. And when I do, I'm reading it and I'm just like, eh, was, I'm falling asleep. And I would pray and it would feel like, wow, it's not like God is standing right there in the room with me anymore. It's, it's like my prayers are getting no farther than the ceiling. And that's not fair. It's not fair to take a guy who had experienced so much and then to take it away from him. And so I worked so hard to try to get it back. I poured myself into devotions. You know, I hadn't really been doing like a scheduled thing before, but I started doing very scheduled discipline at that point. It's like, okay, if, you know, I've, I've, obviously I've done something wrong, so I'm going to work to get it back. So I worked. And it didn't help. I panicked. I threw myself into scripture memory. I memorized entire books of the Bible in an effort to prove to God, I'm serious about this. You know, I'm not turning away from you. This is not my fault. Uh, I think one of the things that really impressed my future father-in-law was the fact that I was engaged in all this scripture memory when he met me. And he's like, wow, this guy is, you know, really spiritual. Yeah. What he didn't know was that was me panicking. And so in my adult life, uh, ever since my college days, it, it has never gone back to that the same way that it was. Um, I have, uh, you know, probably half a dozen times in the last 22 years when I really felt like, wow, the spirit is moving right here in this moment. There have been times. It's not been completely absent, but it is not normal or usual for me anymore. Why? I don't know. It's not my fault. So, what is the point of all of this? I'm sure you're dying to know. Um, I have two, two thoughts that I want to leave you with as a wrap-up. The first thought is God is not safe. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia when they're discussing Aslan the lion who is representing Jesus. And Lucy says, so he, he Aslan, isn't safe? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. That word safe is kind of a tricky word because it is defined very differently depending on your perspective. I think a lot of times when we think of the word safe, we think that means God is never going to do anything crazy. And that's not what it means. 
God has absolutely no problem destroying all of your expectations, crushing them into dust if that's what it takes to accomplish his will. And he doesn't have to tell you what that will is. All he has to do is ask us, are you willing to follow me or are you going to turn away? Many Christians set out determined to live for God. They want to live for God with all their hearts, but no one ever told them that God is not safe. No one ever told them that it is possible to get into a place where nothing makes sense and it feels like you're abandoned. They just, they didn't know. They, all they heard was, be faithful and miracles will take place. And that is so often true, but not all the time. So when they get to that place of difficulty, that place where John the Baptist was, where Peter was, where John, Jesus himself was, they say, I don't know what to do with this. I was never told this could happen. And they're so shocked and so devastated that they just, they turn away and, and never come back. Or they just check out, as we said earlier, and they say, well, okay, so God is not safe. God's not going to protect me, so I have to protect myself. I'm going to wrap myself in armor and keep everything at bay, including God, so that I can not be hurt again. We say to ourselves, okay, if my expectations lead to disappointment, I have the solution for that. I simply won't have any expectations. Um... And as I said before, I can really identify with that because I have been there so much of my life. So this is the first thought that I want to leave you with, that God is not safe. Be aware of what God is capable of. Count the cost before you really decide to follow him. But here's the, the end of that. When you come to the end of all things, and when you are surrounded by loss, if you don't turn away from him, you will discover something. You will discover that God is good. He's not Santa Claus good. He's not superhero good. But he is good. He is the definition of good. He is good in a way that if you haven't been in the place of loss, you, you don't even understand. Only the people who have been there can understand. God is good. He is holy. He is love. He is who he is. The second thought that I have for you is this. We follow God for so many reasons having to do with our expectations. We've already talked about that. That's, that's been woven through the whole message so far. We expect safety. We expect power. We expect provision. We expect love. Uh, and he is pleased to give us those things. He is. He is a good father. He loves to give good things to his children. But his will in his plan is perfect and is above what we can understand and sometimes it doesn't look like he's giving us good things. Sometimes God puts us in a place of wilderness uh, where every external thing we expected is gone. And then we have to ask ourselves the most fundamental question of all, why do I really follow God? What is it that keeps me with him instead of just turning away and giving up and saying, that's it, I'm done? So what's the point? What's the point anymore? If it's going to be like this, what is the point? Now, the one thing that keeps us from that place is our knowledge of who he is. This was the subject of my first sermon last December. Remember who he is. Remember he is the creator, the author of the universe. And when you understand what he has created in all of its vastness, then you understand, oh, God is good. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of like a girl from a very poor family who marries a really rich guy. 
classic fairy tale story. And he, she loves him and she marries him. But no one can ever be really sure why she married him. I don't think she herself can really be sure. Uh, you know, yes, she loves him. Her love is real. And yes, her feelings for him are real. But what if he hadn't been rich? What if he had been just another poor slob like her? Would she still marry him? Would she still love him? Would it be quite the same? And our relationship with God is a lot like that. God is worthy to be worshipped no matter what, just because of who he is. He is glorious beyond our ability to imagine it. He is worthy no matter what. But is this how we know God? Not, not always, not even often, I think. We're the people who love God because he's rich. And we do love him. Our faith is real. But sometimes we love him, at least partially, because he gives us good things. So what happens when everything is stripped away? Do we stick with him or do we turn away? Sometimes God allows seasons of disappointment and loss and abandonment to overwhelm us. Uh, these seasons reveal something to us about ourselves. We can't know God and we can't really love God until every surface reason for our love has been stripped away. When everything is laid bare and when we're brought to that place of utter brokenness, then we can say together with Job, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And we can say with Job, before I had just heard about you, but now, now I know you. We can say, I have lost everything that I thought I valued, all my understanding of who you are, but I know that you're worthy of worship. I will still worship you because you're worthy. In that place, our worship becomes pure and unrefined like gold. And when we worship God there from that place, that is real worship. It's not about the miracles. It's about him. And that's all I have. Walking up here just because. <laughs> Go ahead and sit down, Eric, because otherwise I'll embarrass you. Okay. Uh, here's how you do a, here's how you teach people how to move in faith. You tell them all kinds of stories that inspire them. And then you give them all kinds of examples that inspire them. And then what you do is, is that you put them in there. And by the way, some of the things that you do, you might even tell them stories that aren't exactly true. You know, because it's good for faith. You know what I mean? Well, it's not exactly true, but it builds faith. And you do things to do this. I, I want you to understand something. In some way, you could look at what Eric just preached and say, geez, he's somehow in conflict with Kurt that's telling us to do miracles. And of course, we're not. I'm the one that asked him to preach the sermon, and I knew I asked him to preach it because I knew what he was going to preach. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I believe that one of the reasons why we don't end up moving in miracles is because it's so easy for us to get distracted, that we end up somewhere else. It just happens so fast and so subtle and so easy that we don't even know that it took place until later when it's all crumbled and we try and figure out what happened and then we figure out what happened. Here's what we're trying to do. You don't do a series that lasts a year and a half. That's not a series. That's something else. It's not a series. We're doing a series that's going to last a year and a half. You know why? Because it turns out that 2,000 years is a long time for a thing to fall apart. 
And maybe it's going to take more than four sermons to put it back together. It turns out that things are really complicated and that's why they got messed up. And that we have to be doing something as we're building. We have to be going back and making sure that that foundation is sure all the time. We have to be referencing that foundation. We have to be going back to what are we doing this for? Is it so that we can be powerful? Is it so that we can make people comfortable? Is it so that we can do miracles and that's going to be wonderful and people will come to God? No. There's something that God is doing where he's trying to ground us in him so fundamentally that the things that we do never corrupt because they have been built on solid ground, on the bedrock. And when the wind and the waves comes, that house does not fall. This is what we're doing. I just want to tell you, Eric, I'm, I want to cry right now. And I don't know exactly why. Because what you just said is so true. And yet so is the other thing. And it's not even the other thing because where you got to at the end of that was, why do you love God? <laughs> is there a more fundamental question than that? Because that blows miracles out of the stinking water. Right? If you're focused on that stuff, you know, have fun in your superficiality. That's where it gets wrong. We're trying to ground ourselves in who what his character and his nature is, who he really is and how he wants to be with us and how he wants us to process him. And I just got to tell you, I'm just, I'm just, I don't know about you guys, but I am touched so deeply in my soul. This Job, when you went to the Job passage, it just made me go, it's not like God did, that's the earliest book in the Bible, first book written. It's not like God hasn't been trying to make this principle clear. It's just that we don't get it. <laughs> Because it's so hard to hold on to. It's about him, and then him, and then him again. And that's what we're doing here. We're building our house on a solid rock called Jesus Christ, called God. Reach in front of you and grab that cup, would you? I'm going to give you a little capper here. Many of you know Pete Becker. Surprisingly, he died last night. Sorry, I don't know how to do that more eloquently or kindly or anything else, but that was a big surprise. Sharon said we knew things were bad, but you know, this, this was not what we were expecting. Pete was the one that was in the wheelchair. You, you saw him in the back quite a bit whenever he could get here. And Pete had bad MS, and bad enough that it killed him. And it was for years and years and years and years. And now Pete's with God. <laughs> and Pete didn't get offended. And Pete never turned from him. He had his questions. <laughs> Are you the one? <laughs> Should I be expecting something else? Because I'd like something else. <laughs> This stuff is not academic. This stuff is the difference between life and death. This stuff is the difference between being grounded solidly to where when something like a decades-old problem with MS would strike you and put you in a wheelchair and really cause your life to be a living hell, that you will hold on to him because he has the words of life, because he is life. Lord, in Jesus' holy and precious name, this congregation lifts unto you the bottom cup in which is 